This week's episode is sponsored by Samsung. You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For 50 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. My name is Alan White. And I'm Jill Waterman. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, that powerful catchphrase has been synonymous with athletic competition ever since the early days of televised sports entertainment. Iconic sports images are enduring beacons of inspiration and achievement. But how much do you know about the finer points of photographing the action or the lightning fast high tech journey these images make from the instant the camera goes click to the moment you view the results in the comfort of your home? In today's podcast, we've got the inside track from two experts, Getty Images Chief Photographer, Maddie Meyer, and Managing Editor James Chance, who runs Getty Images Editing Operations in Europe and was instrumental in planning and training the editing team for the upcoming event in Paris. They're joining us today to explain how these visual delicacies are brought to life and served up to international audiences. We'll dive full on into the show in a sec, but first, a small request from all of us to all of you. As we've been telling you as of late, we're now a trending destination on b h Photos' YouTube channel. Finally! Conveniently placed under the podcast tab. Brilliant! So what do you say we start talking? I'll get the ball rolling by posting a remark about today's episode. From there, it's your turn to add your voice to the conversation. We'll be monitoring the discussion as it builds, and we'll give our favorite comments and on-air shout-out as part of an upcoming show. We like to think of the b h Photography Podcast as a collaboration with our listeners, and we consider each of you as an intrinsic part of our show. We couldn't do this podcast without you, and we truly are thankful for your engagement. Now, back to our guests. Maddie Meyer is a chief photographer for Getty Images based in but not geographically limited to Boston, Massachusetts. She joined Getty Images team in January 2015 after earning a Bachelor of Science degree in photojournalism from Ohio University. Maddie's assignments range from covering New England's professional sports teams to international travel, covering events such as the Men's and Women's World Cup, the FINA World Swimming Championships, and the Olympic Games in Rio and Pyeongchang. Her pictures are continually published in major metropolitan newspapers, magazines, and websites worldwide, including ESPN, The New York Times, Sports Illustrated, The Washington Post, among many other media outlets. Equally skilled as a photographer, James Chance began his editing career as a freelancer in London. He currently serves as Getty Images' managing editor for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. He trains the photo editors and oversees the editing operations and scheduling. He's also in charge of editing for major events such as the Women's World Cup of Australia and the Paris Olympic Games. James helped to create the vision for Getty Images remote editing plan, where photo editors will be working out of the company's London office while the photographers will be in Paris. Maddie Meyer and James Chance, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So excited to be here and speaking with all of you. Yeah, thank you for having us. Great having you guys here. Maddie, we're going to start with you. You started at Getty Images as an intern while you were still in college. Were you taking pictures back then or doing gopher chores and other tasks? How did this internship help prepare you for a career as a sports photographer? You know, I have wanted to be a photographer since I was an eight-year-old kid. You know, it's something I always, always really wanted to do. And I worked for the athletics department at my college, which I really enjoyed. And then I applied for the Getty Sport internship in New York City. And I've always known the best place for sport photography is at Getty Images. And the first assignment I had was photographing the U.S. Open tennis tournament in New York with the great team that we have based there. And I just knew right away, you know, sometimes you arrive to a place or meet people where it really just clicks. And I'd had several other internships. I'd I'd, uh, covered politics on Capitol Hill. I'd spent time in other cities. And I just knew this is where I want to be. This is where I want to spend my career. So luckily, they really had me hit the ground running shooting and doing mostly photography, but I got the chance to learn the editing side. I spent some time in the office. I did a little bit of everything, but, you know, my time behind the camera was what was most important and fun and something that I enjoyed the most. 
I, we're going to touch on this a little bit later, but just thing I'm really curious about is that you're going into, you chose sports photography as something going, now photography is, a, is global as far as your choices, where you can go and, and directions you can take. You chose sports, which is traditionally, quote unquote, a man's place. And you're, quote unquote, just a girl. Mm -hmm. um, did you hit a lot of headwind? Because no, even now, you, you, you're a minority. There aren't that many females out there doing what you do. Did, did they give you like, you know, they look at you cockeyed or did you, did they, did you fairly well break into things easily? How, how did it go for you? I mean, I feel like I had the stars align in a lot of ways. And I grew up playing soccer. I loved it. I played on a one of those crazy travel teams that goes up and down the East Coast. And one of my best friends on the team, her dad is a photographer. At the time, he was at AP. Now he's at the New York Times. His name is Doug Mills. He's incredible. And he's the one who I learned from. And he told me repeatedly from the time I was eight through 18 to now, you know, I called him this week. He always said to me, this is a job that's really difficult. It takes a lot of work and dedication, but you belong here just as much as everybody else does. If you put in the work, there's no reason you can't do this. And I think just hearing that repeatedly growing up was so helpful. And again, he really emphasized, you need to have humility. You need to work really hard. Your pictures need to speak for themselves. But he really gave me the confidence and I felt like there's no reason I don't belong here. I've absolutely run into people who have said rude things and, you know, frankly, been discouraging. But I've also had enough people by my side who believe in me, back me, and support me. And then in turn, I've been really happy with the amount of women who have reached out to me and said, that's so cool. I want to do that too. And we've been able to kind of bring them into the fold as well. So I'm really hopeful that some of the comments I got and treatment I got being up and coming and frankly still now are going to start to go away as the industry changes. Yeah, yeah. no two ways about that. That's, it's great. Nothing like a mentoring system. Totally. You're now based in Boston, but you spend a lot of time covering sporting events uh, worldwide. How much of your time is spent traveling versus uh, covering local sporting events? Yeah, it really depends on the year. I would say for the most part, I'm 30 to 40 percent traveling and anywhere between 50 and 70 percent local. The next few years in the U.S. are going to be huge. You know, of course, this is an Olympic year and the Olympics are in Paris, but right around the corner is the World Cup in the U.S. and the Olympics in L.A. So we're really starting to get the prep going for those things now. Um, and because that's local for me, that's a lot of time on the road. But I really enjoy doing the World Cups and the Olympics. So that means um, big chunks of time. But within the U.S., I do a fair amount of golf. And that might be between five and 10 days on the road. I was just at swim trials, which we can talk about, which was about a week and a half. Um, there's things like that kind of interspersed throughout. Well, it's like you were always like, you know, it's, everybody thinks it's just sporting, but the truth of the matter is each of these is kind of a specialty in its own. You have to approach each of these kind of sporting events with a different mindset because you have to work differently to get the shot in each of these events, I would imagine. Definitely. Wow. Now, you're going to be covering uh, the upcoming games in, in, in Paris. How long in advance Will you be getting there? And does your coverage include the documentation of advanced prep or, or other elements aside from the actual competition itself? Right. We arrive about a week ahead of the start of the games. Uh, I, I do, at least, I should say. I arrive about a week ahead of time. But we've had um, members of our team on the ground as early as last week. Uh, and what they do is set up our tech support, get our office set up. They will preview some of the venues. They'll take a look at the transport so that when the majority of the team arrives on the ground, we have a little bit more information and there's less kind of troubleshooting. We're pretty ready to go. Because as you all can imagine, you know, once the opening ceremony kicks off, it is full on for the entirety of the games. And as far as documentation ahead of time goes, um, you know, we work with our communications team within Getty Images, and they like to talk about, you know, what's in your bag, what's your mindset, that type of thing. Um, so there's a little bit of that, but certainly more once we arrive, there's the preview imagery, some things I'm sure you, you might already be seeing of images of the rings on the Eiffel Tower. We have our team there already kind of getting those preview images ready to go. How big a team from Getty is at the Olympics? 
the photographers versus, uh, you know, communications people and other types of um, support system. I might need to phone a friend with James. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get this right. <laughs> James, do you know? Yes, I do. We have uh, over 60 photographers there. Um, wow. On the ground, uh, we have 10 tech staff or uh, tech support. And then I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure how many operations people we have on the ground, but I would take a good educated guess at probably around 10 to 15 hmm. um, as well. So it's a very big operation on the ground. Mm-hmm. Well, also, the uh, camera manufacturers uh, typically send support teams there with rental gear, for lack of better terms, uh, support systems for working photographers. Do you know which of the manufacturers will be at the upcoming games? I can only speak to Canon since that's who we work with. Ah, okay. But what I can say from experience is usually Canon, Nikon, and Sony are all set up kind of in a bit of a row together, which is great. That's what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. As far as Canon goes, I know we've been in communication with them about what type of rental gear we will need specifically for our team. And then we have an office where... You know, if I say, hey, I have an idea I want to try, is there a tilt shift lens? Is there a prime lens? Is there a a longer lens than what I have? That's something that I can grab from that kind of loner station. But we love all the camera support, particularly for cleaning and checking the sensors. You know, we're really putting this gear through the ringer and having that support is really important and we're really thankful for it. So, so Canon is the official camera of these events. Is that what you're saying? No, Getty Images has a partnership with Canon. That's what I meant. Okay, that's what I meant. I'm sorry, yes. But of course, we see the other manufacturers present as well, and there's support typically for them. Okay. Um, what sports will you be covering during the games, uh, and, and who determines all of this? That is a great question. I'm covering aquatics. There are a few teams of people working on specific sports for the sake of consistency and in covering those sports in between the Olympics. So I'm working with a team of five aquatics specialists, if you will. And we've covered the world championships in between. We cover the swim trials in our respective countries. So aquatics for us means swimming, diving, artistic swimming, and water polo. So I'll be working with that team covering those events specifically. We also have the same sort of philosophy with athletics because it's such a tech heavy sport. There's a lot of remote cameras. There's a lot of photographers. It's something where having the experience of covering athletics helps our work stand out. It's kind of a tough sport to just throw somebody in the infield at. Um, And gymnastics, we have a cohesive team. The rest, for the most part, we have photographers do a rotation of images so they can stay fresh and come away with something different and create a really nice variety from the games. So that's been really cool to see. So I'll be in just a few venues really focusing on those aquatic sports, but for the majority of our photographers, they'll get a taste of a few different things. And that's decided by Martin Willits, who is an assignment editor in Europe, but he works in collaboration with the different kind of regional directors within our umbrella. Now, photographically speaking, which sport or multiple sports are you are your favorites and which ones do you find the most challenging? So I love photographing swimming and I think that it's kind of a broad answer, but I think with sport, especially with how fantastic these cameras are now, anybody can get a hand on them. It's not that difficult to be okay at it. It's not that difficult to come away with something, but it's incredibly difficult to come away with something special or unique or excellent. So for me, I think swimming is difficult to do something really that differentiates you because, you know, we know where the athletes are going, right? It's up and down this pool and you see it repeatedly and the light isn't going to change because it's inside. You have a lot of constants And so I feel confident going in that I can get something, but can I and can our team come away with something that you haven't seen before? That's where the real challenge comes in. And that's where I would say it's really difficult. But that's where knowing the athletes comes in, knowing the way they move, knowing their rituals before they get in the pool, knowing some of the dynamics between the athletes, uh, where you can really kind of pick up on the minutia to try and make something special. So what you're saying is that the longer you do this consistently, 
the better you can be because you understand, and this has to do with any sport, the players and their mindset and, and how to anticipate the way they will most likely interact out on the field or out on wherever they are competing. So it's a kind of thing where as somebody who's done it multiple times, you have the edge on somebody who's stepping in for the first time in many ways. I would say sometimes it's hard to say anything's an absolute because something that I love about the Olympics is you can, you know, for example, in Tokyo, I did two days of wrestling. I had never covered wrestling. I was excited to see it. And I think I came away with some special pictures because there's so much emotion coming out of these athletes. We have a really talented team there. I'm confident we could have people come in and come away with something special. I think there's two different types of photos, um, broadly speaking. One is the one you make by you're in the right spot. You're, you're prepared as a photographer, but it's what happens in front of you. You know, the incredible reaction to somebody winning gold. And the second type is one that you can really kind of map out ahead of time of where do I want this remote to go? What are my camera settings going to be? And that second type is one where I do think it really benefits to have people who know the key players, know the venue, know the sport really well to try and have some... Um, prediction and and map out a unique idea. Mm-hmm. The gear that you're using mm -hmm. and the performance levels of the gear has a lot to do with how you cover an event. Now, and I remember back in the day when I was doing competitions, three and a half to five and a half frames per second was considered, oh, you're aces, man. You're not going to miss a damn thing. Now we're doing 20 frames per second and higher, uh, um, which makes it easier to catch that moment within a moment than ever before, but it also means to do that. It's, it, there's two ways you shoot in the yard. You'd either be able, you keep your finger on the shutter and just anticipate the good old fashioned way, mm -hmm. or you could see things coming and just holding that button down at maximum frames per second, knowing that somewhere on that card is a hell of a good picture, but you got to find it. Mm -hmm. Which way do you work? Do you like prefer working flat out or is it, and this also might vary depending on what sport you're covering at the time. Do you prefer to shoot for maximum to make sure you're getting every little minutia of, of what's happening out in front of your camera? Or do you try to anticipate more and shoot less? You know, I try my best to shoot less only because somebody has to look through these pictures, whether it's yeah. me, whether it's James, whether it's somebody <laughs> else in London, which we'll get to. So I would rather not have a full card to go through. But there's moments where, you know, I was just at swim trials, like I said, and Caleb Dressel, um, there's this huge story. It's kind of a comeback after he left the world swimming trials two years ago to now qualifying for three events. There's really this huge narrative of he's back. And after his last race, he climbed up on a lane line and raised his fists in the air. And you better believe for that, I was getting every frame I possibly could <laughs> because that's the big moment. We'd been waiting all week for what is he going to do? Is there an image that's going to show his story here? And that's a big piece of it. But when it comes to action... I'll take swimming just because that's what I'm kind of focusing on. Let's talk about Katie Ledecky. So incredible American swimmer, record breaker, amazing performances. But if you're photographing every stroke she takes for a 1500 meter race, I mean, you're, you're going to have to go through a ton of cards. So I know, for example, I prefer to photograph her towards the end of a lane line. I like doing that because it's the cleanest spot in the pool. Uh, if you can imagine, you know, the center of the pool, it's, it's usually blue and white, blocks in the lane lines. And that's pretty distracting. So if you go towards the end of the pool, you're shooting into either blue or red and it's much cleaner. I also know that there's really probably one, maybe two strokes where you're going to get her head out of the water and she only breathes over her right shoulder. So for a 1500 meter race, I might only photograph 14 or 15 strokes of Katie Ledecky for that whole race. So that kind of combines a few things of knowing the athlete, knowing the pool, and knowing, okay, I could get many more images, but this is where the good ones are going to be. And let me just try and pare down yeah. the uh, possibilities of tens of thousands of images. But hey, if she jumps off the lane line and does backflip, I will hammer that sequence for sure. No two ways about that. Yeah. Uh, something uh, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, showing up and prepping beforehand. Um, I know that there are specific areas where the photographers have to be positioned because otherwise mm -hmm. you have chaos because everybody's going to be in the middle of the field otherwise. Right, yeah. Um, are these positions 
selected by the photographers, say someone from Getty Images, mm -hmm. for instance, or or key photographers, are, are they tapped into like what? Where would you people prefer to be for your best, or are or do they pre-select that and you show up and say, "Hey, this is great," or "Geez, what the hell were they thinking?" Mm -hmm. Or do you draw straws? Is there a procedure like that? That's a great question. Um, often there are spaces reserved for the global agencies. And those are areas that we get preference to over maybe Greek local media or French local media, somebody who's covering for one country or one organization. We, meaning AFP, AP, Reuters, often have a little kind of zone, like a preferential zone that sometimes we have access to over everybody else. But let's take swimming, for example, again, we'll be in five shooting positions. One is the pool deck, which we'll have access to, which is a limited number of photographers determined by the IOC and the photo venue managers. And on the pool deck, there's areas we're allowed to go and areas we aren't. But within that, you're kind of negotiating with the other photographers. So for example, if Caleb Dressel is swimming the 100 meter butterfly, and you want to get a head-on photo of him at the end of the lane he's swimming in, you're working around five or six other photographers. You're kind of threading a needle there and you have to kind mm -hmm. of communicate about, okay, I'm right over your shoulder. Please don't stand. I I'm going to sit on the ground crawled up in a little ball. And many sports are that way where you're kind of working with your neighbors a little bit and hope that there's that mutual respect of we're all trying to do a job here. We also have an underwater robotic camera for the aquatics. We have two, one in each different venue. And so for that, there's an operating area because other agencies have similar technology. So that's an area where we have, um, of course, a unique view because it's underwater, but the cameras are cabled so that we will be sitting in a row up in the stands. And that space has been under negotiation for well over a year of how long are the cables that each agency has, where can we have a view? How much space do you all need? And again, this is back and forth with diagrams for well over a year to try and negotiate that space. Ooh. So I would say it varies. And then, you know, skipping around to winter just for a moment, there's times I've been on the side of the mountain and you can have the whole side of the mountain. So you're just kind of trying to scout it, get there early, figure out what makes sense and go from there. Hmm. What, what percentage of the cameras are still have photographers, living, breathing photographers behind them, as opposed to remote cameras, which are increasingly being used to, to very good effect? Uh, roughly, what percentage would you uh, of these images we're seeing are remote images compared to real photographer images? I would say still the vast majority of images people are seeing are with photographers behind them particularly in a place where it's pretty highly regulated like the Olympics, there's a lot of bars you need to clear to set up remotes. Uh, my exception would be track and field. For example, the 100-meter final, there are a lot of remotes set up at that finish line, at the head-on position. For that, I might say it's 50-50. But for something like aquatics, I would say 20% might be from a remote. And then something like basketball, one of our colleagues is covering basketball the whole time probably 25% of his images will be from a remote and the 75% will be him hand-holding the camera. Mm, okay. Now, as you mentioned, you're using Canon. I would assume that you've, mm -hmm. uh, you're, no one's using DSLRs anymore and everyone's gone mirrorless. Um, first of all, is that, is that a correct assumption? And if it is, uh, what are you using these days as far as cameras and lenses? Right. Yeah, that is a correct assumption. Everybody on our team is on mirrorless cameras, which... I've really loved, in particular, how quiet they are. Like I mentioned before, I cover some golf, and it's incredible for being behind these athletes, close to these athletes, um, where, of course, golfers are really sensitive to that sound. Um, uh, example for the Olympics would be I set up remotes on the starting blocks. So you may have seen those images of the swimmers diving in um, at the start of each race. And for that, you would have to be really careful because you need them the moment they leave the starting block. With this, you can be a little bit more liberal because it's not making that noise to distract the athletes, which is just great all around. Because also sometimes you'd have a wire short circuit or something where you're hearing that shutter and it can be very disruptive. So we love that. I personally will be using three R3 cameras. 
And I'm loving the 28 to 70 right now, F2. I find going from 2.8 to F2 just helps so much. And some of these messy situations that we <laughs> we come across, just helping clean it up and kind of create something that's a little bit different as an option has been huge. You know, a two eight is great, and I've I've had so many of these two eight zooms. But yeah, that extra stop <laughs> makes a difference. It really, Huge, really does. Yeah. Back in the heyday of magazines, which I remember quite well myself, <laughs> if you were going for a cover or a single page, uh, say a full bleed, you shot vertically, uh, and if you wanted to spread, you shot horizontally, and and this was regardless of the sport. In the case of the twenty twenty four games in Paris. Is there a preferred format or the photographer's urge to just follow your visual instincts, fill the frame for maximum, and just basically get the best shot and let the editors and deal with it after that? I would say there's certainly emphasis to get the best shot. I try to shoot mostly horizontally because that's what we see used more than vertical images. Of course, with social media, there's a huge need now for vertical. You know, the demand used to be, like you mentioned, for magazines and magazine covers. But now we think about Instagram reels, TikToks, hmm. posts on all those social platforms. So it's not something we can ignore the need for vertical still. Um, so we are certainly encouraged to do what you can to make the best picture. I, something I love about working at Getty Images is we're really encouraged to take that risk to see things the way that we best think they could be illustrated. But James can speak to it a little bit that if there's an image that can be sent both ways, if it's a key moment, they might send a few different versions so that our clients can grab what suits their needs best. Gotcha. Maddie, there's a bunch of new sports that are going to be in Paris this year. Is there anything that you've never photographed before that you're looking forward to trying, perhaps? I am pretty locked into the swimming pool, but if mm. I can get out, I would love to photograph the break dancing. I think that would mm. be so cool. I also didn't get the chance to photograph skateboarding in Tokyo, which I think would be fantastic. You know, I'm such a, a sport lover and, and fan that the more sports are present, the better. And break dancing in Paris would be really, really cool. Also, the fact that dressage is in front of Versailles, <laughs> I think would be huh. incredible too. Some of these backgrounds, honestly, I think are, they certainly can't compete to the star power of these athletes that are what we're celebrating. But some of these images we're going to see, I think are going to be really dramatic and beautiful scene setters for these games. So you said you you're pretty locked into the aquatics and the mm -hmm. pool. Are you shooting every day? What's your schedule like? Do you have a time off that you could, say, make a trip to Versailles? Or how does that work? It's pretty demanding, but frankly, that's how I want it. I, I love the aquatics umbrella of sports in particular. It's pretty demanding because there's several sessions a day. For swim, there's two sessions. For diving, water polo. And um, artistic, there are multiple sessions a day. So because of that, that's why we have a team dedicated to it. Uh, my time off is going to come after. I'm going to take a trip to Nice with one of my coworkers, which I'm really looking forward to. But it's pretty foot on the gas for the entire games. Wow. All right, we are going to take a short break. And we come back, we're going to hear from Jane Chance, who is the managing editor for Getty Images. Stay tuned. Out in the field, you need rugged, sustainable data storage to keep your camera footage safe. The Samsung T7 Shield portable SSD meets those needs and more with its tough, drop-proof exterior, dust and water resistance, and its ultra-compact size. The T7 is not only durable, it provides fast read-write speeds with the latest USB and NVMe technology, thermal guards to maintain performance in any environment, and it comes in multiple colors and capacities to choose from. Head on over to bnh.com for more information about the Samsung T7 Shield and all their memory products, or use the link in our podcast show notes. Okay, we are back, and we are being joined now by James Chance, who's the managing editor for Getty Images. And uh, uh, James is going to be in charge of the whole shebang uh, for the Paris games. So welcome again to the show. Now, you worked as a photographer before shifting 
to the other side of the camera as a photo editor, and then moving into your current role as a managing editor for Getty Images. Has your photo background been advantageous when it comes to making astute image selections? I don't see how you could say it hasn't been. And communicating with photographers about their pictures? Uh, 100%. I think having a photography background really helps you kind of see pictures. I know we always talk in the industry about you've either you can you know, you've got the eye, the photographic eye, you can see pictures. And I think as Maddie said earlier, when we come to those kind of opportunities that the photographer is, has got something in their head and they're going to try something, um, you know, having that photography um, expertise and shooting yourself really helps kind of see those pictures. And also, I think technically it really helps as well. So the editors I always see, we're there to kind of support the photographers on the ground. I'm currently editing the Euros football soccer competition at the moment. And the photographers, for example, will send a white balance test in before the game. So they might send us a test with a white balance and just say, could you have a look at that and just check it over for us? Um, me and the editors were all working on kind of calibrated monitors. So we could be kind of color accurate monitors. So we can actually go back and provide photographers with, yes, it's looking good. Maybe a little bit of a tweak here, a little bit of a tweak there. Um, similarly, we have uh, photographers putting remotes down behind the goal, for example. They'll send a test in for us to look at the focus. Because as you can imagine, trying to work out where a focus point is on the back of your camera can be very tricky, whereas we can blow it up nice and big on our screen and kind of help like that. So I think it definitely has its advantages. Um, and also, I think it really helps photographer relationships as well, kind of trust. I think if the photography team know that you're working on your own craft and your own kind of photography, they have uh, trust. And you know, a lot of our editors um, also are training to be photographers. And at Getty Images, we use the editing team as kind of a, a training ground and a development part um, to help people progress in editing and photography. Um, so I think it definitely has massive advantages uh, when it comes to editing. Yeah, I, I don't see how it could. I mean, or some kind of a visual training just to be able to recognize what makes an image strong or not strong. You mentioned something that was very interesting to me that you you work with each individual photographer to check uh, uh, the, the the light balance and 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 the way the 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 photographer's camera is recording the color as well as focus. And, and that makes a tremendous amount of sense because you don't want to learn during the games that somebody's focus is off or the color isn't correct. So you actually work with each photographer to fine tune their gear so that the images that you receive are in a sense pre-edited or they're tweaked to a point where they could go easier into the uh, uh, lineup. Is that correct? Yeah, only on certain events. So, for example, I'm talking about the football soccer. I said, if it's a night game, for example, the photographers will try and set white balance. They'll send it into us and we can obviously make sure it's all correct because you want the picture out of camera to be as near perfect as possible. If a photographer wants it to be near perfect, it saves us time in the editing process if we don't have to correct the colours, if that makes sense. And I said, especially around the kind of focus is, is more for the remote cameras. So we have remote cameras behind each goal. Uh, um, okay. And obviously, we're looking to set the focus point around the goal line. So basically, they're sending us a test picture, and we're obviously said blowing it up nice and big and checking that that is correct. Because as you said the worst thing you want is at half time, you know, there's been a goal going in the first half, really nice, big on your remote, and then you get a message from me going, "Oh, I'm so sorry, but it's not quite sharp where it needs to be." Um, so we try and help the photographers as much as we can. And I think that really builds a strong trust and relationship between editors and photographers because we're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to achieve an amazing set of pictures at the end of the day. Sure. Well, remote cameras aside, uh, how many photographers are you going to have on the ground in Paris? Uh, so as the IOC official photography agency, we have, I believe, 60 photographers on the ground at the Olympics. What I will say is we spoke about it earlier, but it's not just 60 photographers. We have various remotes, um, robotic remotes at the right. games. So we will have some fixed cameras that are kind of on tripods or on boom arms around venues that are fixed in a position. And a photographer will have access to either a pocket wizard or a remote to fire that when they want in the stadium. So sometimes it could be like a nice general view of the stadium and they will basically press the button to fire that when they want. Um, also, we've got, as Maddie mentioned earlier, we've got robotic cameras. So we've got the underwater robotic at the swimming, which is in a housing in a case, but it's also, because it's robotic, the photographers on the ground can actually move it around so they can recompose it, they can change it, change the zoom on the lens if they want, and basically have control of the camera underneath the water effectively without having to actually have a diver go down and make that change. So that is obviously a fantastic piece of kit that we use. 
Hmm. We'll have a robotic camera at the boxing, a bird's eye view of the boxing, because normally the boxing ring has like a really nice Olympic rings. So if anyone gets knocked out, or if there's a nice punch picture, a bird's eye view can work really nicely from that as well. So we're using lots of different remotes and robotics at the games. It's not just the 60 photographers that you see with handheld cameras. When the photographer's operating the robotic camera, what are they viewing the image with? Um, they have a little screen. That is a great question. I believe, and maybe Maddie can kind of confirm it, but I believe they're using a laptop on site ah. in some software that we have to be able to control that camera and set the exposure and compose it how they want, basically. And it's kind of going back to what Maddie was saying earlier. They've got obviously an image in their head or they're trying to create an image of what they know is going to happen in the pool and how that will look nice. Yeah, right. I can jump in really quick. We have a specific monitor that gives us a feed without any delay of what's going on under the water. And then we trigger it with, it looks kind of like a like an Xbox remote. It's shaped the same way. And then we have our laptops where we see the images come into our editing software and can run it through a preset kind of filter to add a little bit of contrast, make a little bit of a tweak. This is specific to mm. underwater because you're shooting through so much water, you know? Mm. Whereas the remote and robotic cameras for other sports, they might not need that kind of tweak out of camera at all. Like James was mentioning, wanting to get it as close to perfect out of camera as possible. So we're up there with, with two separate monitors, one to look at treating it like the viewfinder and the other to process the images. Wow. Something I'm curious about, we're talking a lot about robotics and, and the kind of images that they're capable of taking. Would it be possible for a killer photograph captured with a robotic camera to win a press photography award? Hmm. Yeah, certainly. And they have already. Have I mean, they? Yes. I, I think the thing to keep in mind when we talk about robotics, it's easy to get this image of like, is there a robot up there making these choices and decisions? Well, it's just, there's, yeah. nobody, well there's nobody standing behind the camera is really what it is, but right. there is somebody watching the images. Totally. I mean, it's just kind of the next level of, you know, I'm sure many of us are familiar with glass remotes at basketball. You know, the remote camera set up behind the backboard where you get great pictures of the athletes dunking the basketball. That would be kind of a still stagnant remote where you're imagining, okay, we see... Jason Tatum dribbling down court by himself. We know what's going to happen next and you're firing it. For aquatics, the first kind of step was the same kind of static camera where our photographers would dive down. They'd have to compose the focus down there and you'd be going for one image. You know, yeah. the start of the race, one athlete in one lane. And this is cranking it up about 10 notches where you're still going through that thought process. Let's take Katie Ledecky again. We know... And we hope going forward, she's going to continue to stay pretty far ahead of the people she's competing against. So what comes to mind for me right away is like, okay, lane four, many of us have seen that image where she's in front and there's people following behind her. So you could be center of lane four and take that picture. But you could also turn the camera and get her diving into the pool. So it's the same kind of process of that static remote, but you get way more per race or per event than you could have with something you can't adjust. Um, mm. The thing that's really exciting now is because you can adjust that shutter speed, we're having people pan images on the robotic, being able to move it since it's not static, and come away with things where it does feel like you're actually behind the camera and able to move it and control it exactly the way you want. Mm. Then we've been talking about all the photographers out there. How many editors uh, are they going to be overseeing the work in London? And, and will there be any photo editors uh, on site in Paris? So we will have 27 editors in our London office. And we have a mixture of editors um, from all over the world. We have editors from the UK, from Spain, Italy, Sweden, America, Australia, Japan, mm -hmm. and Argentina. We're bringing our kind of global talent to our London office to create the best talent and the best team we have available to us. We also have seven remote editors in the UK as well that will work from home. We have four remote editors in Australia working as part of the team. Um, and we also have 10 remote editors working in America as part of that team. Um, so it's a very large operation. Um, and I said, we won't actually be having any photo editors on site in Paris at all for this game, which will be the first time we've ever done that. Wow. 
I guess you really don't necessarily need them to be there. I mean, essentially, it's, it's irrelevant. So, are, are there are there layers of editors? Do you know? In other words, you get this raw feed coming, and you got all these zillions of pictures. Um, it, it, are there groups like the first group will take stuff, call it down, just get rid of all the stuff that's obviously bad, uh, or or pull stuff that looks promising, and then the next layer of editors will go through that with a finer tooth comb until you have a whatever final group says, these are the selects, these are the heroes? Or do you look for those winners and the heroes right up front? H how does it work? What's the dynamic? It's a very, very big operation. We have many different aspects. So as Medi said, on the photography front, we have specialist teams for um, swimming, athletics, um, gymnastics, um, and cycling. So in the editing world, we actually have the same for editing. So we have a dedicated team for athletics, we have a dedicated team for gymnastics, um, cycling, uh, and swimming. So we have dedicated editors towards that. We are also going to have what we're calling a live picture desk in London. They will handle content from other sports around the games. And then also our APAC and Amir Moro edit teams will also handle sports uh, more suited to their region. In terms of how we create these teams, because we kind of see them as like separate teams, if that makes sense. We're all one global team, but we have specialists in each of these teams. Um, the way we will work is we have a three-stage workflow. We have one or two people that we would call the tagger, which is the lead person of that smaller individual team. They are basically going through the pictures that the team receives. They're selecting the pictures that we're actually choosing to send to our clients and customers. Once that picture has been selected, it then moves through to our Photoshop team. So we will have a selection of people that designate to Photoshop all of our Photoshoppers will be working on color accurate calibrate monitors. So we're seeing colors as they should be. We can adjust them as we need to. And then lastly, it gets sent through to our caption team. They'll be using hotkeys, which is for shortcut code keys. So instead of typing in a athlete's name and of Team America, for example, we will have a little um, shortcut combination. So you might only need to put in four or five numbers or combinations of letters and numbers for that to uh, apply into our caption field. And they will basically apply all of the metadata in terms of the caption, what's going on, who's in the picture. Uh, and then after that, we are sending it to all of our clients and all of the world, basically. You know, you talk about uh, Photoshop, and I know that that, that uh, uh, editing images can be a very sensitive thing. Now, obviously, you, you're checking uh, a color, uh, which is really, really important. And other, uh, other little things like tonality and things of that sort. And if there's random dust, I imagine you'll take a dust mark off. Where do you draw the line in Photoshop? Because at some point you're now changing the picture. Is it merely for tweaking technical accuracy uh, and cleanliness of images, in other words, keep them dust from dirt free? Um, or do you ever go beyond that for whatever reason you might have to? No, of course, we would never go above that or beyond that, basically. Uh, obviously, we uphold uh, our kind of editorial guidelines and standards that get images. So. What we actually do to a picture is quite simple. I think people that probably aren't in the know think we do a lot more to it. But normally the kind of standard process would be that we'd open a picture into Photoshop. We'd make exposure changes or contrast changes if needs be, make that image pop a little bit. We would then basically apply a crop that we think makes that picture better and then just process it through to caption send. So we're only really cropping and making tonal changes to the picture. We're never ever removing anything or making any drastic changes that would go too far as such. Basic, simple cleanup, it's all it is. Nothing editorial. Yeah, exactly. Most of the pictures we receive from our photographers, and I know I'm incredibly biased here, is in a very good spot. They don't need much doing to them. You know, we have amazing photographers that we work with. Um, and, you know, 90% of that content just needs a little bit of a helping hand, a little tweak, just to kind of add the cherry on top and make it the best it can be. Now, you need more than just an external hard drive to keep all this uh, uh, together. Uh, what kind of technical tools are, are needed to power the image workflow and file management for a remote operation of, of this scale? What's the hardware and software uh, involved in this? That is a very great question. So we have at Get Images a fantastic technology team and event support team, which handles a lot of the technical side for us. Um, we've been planning this operation for the last four years. So I've been speaking to the tech team over the last four years and we've been making plans of how we want to do this. Obviously, we have to make plans of how we make it all work globally as well. As I said, we've got people from all over the world. So we have to take that into consideration. Our tech team, I will give them the plan and tell them how I'd like it to work. They go away and they make it work, basically. They make some magic happen. 
Um, I think we're going to have a lot of the servers in Paris and everyone else from the world will connect to Paris. But to go into the finer details, I'll be honest, I'll take the team to just do it for us and make it work, really. So how much of a tech team is there in Paris? So I believe we will have uh, 10 members of our technology team in Paris. There will be a couple of them that will be based in our Paris office, which is where all of our servers are kept, the hub as such. I remember when we went to the Winter Olympics in China, there is like a massive block of computers or servers. Imagine that a server room. We have a couple of blocks of those that obviously we're all working from. So we have like two members of the team in there kind of monitoring that, making sure that's all kind of working. And then I believe the rest of the eight members of the team will be out supporting our photographers on ground. There'll be people supporting the remote system, making sure everything runs smoothly. Because as you can imagine, it's not just the editors that need technical support or remote support. It's also the photographers to make sure they can get images to the server to us as well. Mm. And so how is it working for the photographers to send the images to the servers in, in Paris? Does it happen in real time or do images pile up to a certain amount and then get sent? I'll probably hand it all over to Maddie because she's sure. the one that's got more experience in that. Mm. Yeah, of course. Typically what we do, and it varies by event, which I think is fascinating, or even the hmm. point in time in an event. Usually what we do is a tag and send workflow. And by that we mean, let's take again, Katie Ledecky's race just for the sake of consistency here. I would go through and send just my selects, just the tagged images from my camera, either wirelessly or with an ethernet cable plugged in. Each photographer has an individual FTP address that will send to the servers and are delivered to the editors. So the editors on their back end have already set up, okay, Maddie is at session 15 of swimming. Here's the caption info. And those images that come through are, are given that metadata. Where sometimes we change it is, for example, something that is fast and a lot of important imagery, like 100 meter dash, where the photographers might be on send all and cabled because that's the most stable way to send the images. Mm -hmm. And every image they send would then go through the servers to the editors. And we get pretty specific because like we spoke about earlier, the shutter speed on these cameras is so high. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's eight photographers covering the 100 meter final. We might say, hey, you two or you three go on send all. These other positions will be tag and send and just send that key winning moment so the editors can get that out as quickly as possible and don't have to wade through so mm -hmm. many images. And James can speak to it too, where sometimes an editor might say, hey, this is our photographer in the key position. This editor is going to focus just on this photographer for this specific event. And this other editor will take care of these three photographers who are in areas that might not produce as many pictures from something in particular. So it's really interesting that we can get so strategic working in partnership with our editing team. And I know from the photographer side, we want to do the best we can to make the image. There's a lot of pressure on that. But also, we need to make it as easy as we can for the editing team to do their job and not bog them down <laughs> with one million things to sort through. Yeah, but it's amazing that you're actually doing a sort of pre-edit mm -hmm. on site. I mean, is there time in between races that you're going to that? Is that how it works with the tag and send? Yeah, and I think that also comes to knowing your sport and knowing mm -hmm. when you have a moment to do that. For example, I know where my coworkers are. And, and the way I think about it is this is their picture. You know, if you take, for example, uh, shooting a soccer game and there's a goal on the other side of the pitch or a corner kick on the other side, I know that that's my coworkers on that end. I certainly will be paying attention, photograph as backup if it's a really key moment, but I know I'm not in position to make the best image at that time. So those are moments when you can kind of take a look or... When athletes are being announced, that's really big, certainly for track and gymnastics and swimming or even water polo, they'll announce the teams. If I have a coworker who I know is in that prime spot and I'm on the other end of the pool, I'll flip through it and send what I can quickly. Just one last question. Mm -hmm. When you're doing the tag and send, is the whole take being looked at again after the fact in case 
there's something incredible that got missed? Mm-hmm. It depends on the event. You know, if it's, if it's the heats, there are, <laughs> oh my gosh, like at least 15 heats of, let's say, the 100 meter freestyle. That's not something the editors need to hold on to. I will back up the entire take on my computer, but I will just send through the keyframes because particularly for something like swimming or, or even any sport, there's those kind of in-between moments that you catch where somebody's eyes might be closed or their tongue is sticking out in a way where there really is no need for this image to see the light of day. We just right. send through the ones that we say, hey, this is usable. This has a clean background. This has the athlete in peak performance or showing something that we need to see, a celebration, dejection, anything like that. So I do know, James, you could speak to this a little bit. Maybe the World Cup final, you're getting the full take, but generally with tag and send, you can send pretty heavily and and hold the rest back. Yeah, and most of the time, the photographers, just their responsibility to a certain degree to make sure they send us the pictures we need. I think we have great communication with the photographers. So for example, as Maddie said, say she sent a picture to us and the athlete's eyes were closed. I would then drop her a message and just say, I'm at a great frame, but unfortunately the eyes are closed. Could you just go back and have another look and just send us a couple extra? And at that moment, I could even say to Maddie, and we do sometimes, of just send me that whole sequence because I know you're busy and I'll go through and select the one where the eyes are correct and good to go. So I think that is kind of really important. And I think what I would also say is that with the kind of editing operation for the Olympics, as Maddie said, we kind of prioritize and strategically plan each sport differently because each sport is different and we have to photograph each sport differently, we have to edit each sport differently. But also with the technology we have, we use a editing software, which is a Getty Images own branded software developed in-house, which is called Focus. And Focus basically means that the editors in London and across the world, we can all connect to the same servers. So effectively, we may have the live desk on the same server as the athletics, The athletics team will kind of filter just to the athletics event. So they're working on that and we will be filtering to other events. But when it comes to the 100 meter finals, for example, we will go, right, this is a big moment. This is a big story. Right, five people from the live desk team, you need to switch over now to the 100 meter finals. So then we basically expand that team from, let's say, five to 10, which then allows us to really concentrate and kind of hone in on those kind of big moments, big stories. And that is what is really great about our software we use focus is because we can all chip in and help each other out and move resource. And it's really flexible how we move resource to make sure we are really concentrating on those big moments, big athletes and big stories. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. Cool. So are there any visual feeds at the games that show the photographers so you can see, you know, where they are in relation to the game and you can communicate with them about positioning? There isn't any visual feeds as such to actually see the photographers. The IOC provides all media with access to a live feed system so we can watch any sport um, that's going on and obviously keep track of the sport that we're editing. Mm -hmm. What I would say is, once again, we have lots of preparation, lots of communication with the photographers. So, for example, Maddie was saying about the five position in swim. We would basically communicate that with a visual plan, something that's made from Photoshop, so the editors know where all of the photographers are. And we use it quite a lot in soccer, where we have a pitch plan. And for example, I will note down where each photographer is in each corner. So if a goal goes in in that corner, we know that, like for example, Maddie Myers is going to have the best image. So let's make sure we concentrate on her imagery. So we do kind of have a lot of pre production and communication around where people are going to be positioned, where they're going to be sitting, but there isn't any kind of visual feed as such to see the photographers in action. We might catch them on a glimpse every now and then. I would say too, it's a really cool way to see how our tech team, the editing team, and the photographers work together so closely. So for example, like I mentioned to you all, um, the diagrams of these venues, we've had them for well over a year, I would say, while the venues are in construction. So I've been in contact with our tech team saying, hey, these are the spots that I know you typically use for swimming. Is that your plan? Should we make sure other areas are cabled? Should we talk to the venue operations team at the IOC and with Paris to talk about making sure these places have drops or access where you have internet? Then I came up with the plan for the position of all the photographers for the aquatics. And that's a conversation of, you know, 
we have photographers from all over the world. And I say, hey, you know, Quinn, he lives in Melbourne. Are there races you want specifically? Because you've been following Team Australia and it looks like they're going to do well in these certain events. Where would you like to be? So that rotation, I've been speaking to them about for a few months now. And then in turn, we can speak to the editors and say, this is where the photographers will be, just so you know, like James said about if there's a key moment, you know who will have it, most likely, as well as, hey, this person's roaming. This person isn't by a hard line. You might not see images from this person immediately, but these two people are the ones you can rely on for getting images consistently throughout the event. I think that's really key as well. So for example, for all of our kind of major events and daily edits we do, We have a WhatsApp group with the editors and the photographers, and that communication is really important. So, for example, as Maddie said, letting me know that someone's roaming. So then in my head, I'm not going, oh, I've not seen a picture from Maddie for 20 minutes. I need to check in and just double check if the comms are down, if there's any problems. But the fact that Maddie's already told me, right, I'm going to be roaming today, I already know, okay, that's fine. She's not got cable. I can not worry about that. And I'll see the pictures when she gets back to the cable, basically. Hmm. Cool. So is WhatsApp the preferred communication method between the editors and photographers? It is normally in Europe. I know it's a little bit different in America, Maddie, but for the Olympics, we will use WhatsApp, I would say, as our main communication tool between editors and photographers. And also, as we mentioned earlier, the technology team are also in those conversations as well. So, for example, say there is a problem with one of the cables, the technology team can be made aware really quickly and kind of react as quickly as possible to make sure that we get it back up and running. Cool. And those WhatsApp groups, I think, are so valuable because, James, you can take over here because I know you do a lot of setup, but let's say it is the gold medal basketball game. James will set up a group with the editors that are on that event, the photographers that are on the event, and the technician assigned to that event. So everybody's on the same page. And you can communicate of what images were sent when or say, hey, I, I can't get a picture out. The editors can say... I'm seeing it, it's corrupt, I'm not seeing it. And the technician can either be on site and go see you, the photographer, to make sure, is it your camera? Is it the cable? Troubleshoot on that end or take a look at the servers on the back end too. It's always fantastic as well to have that WhatsApp group. For example, we will share stories. So for every editor, a bit like the photographers, to be honest, normally has their specialist sports that they're into. And obviously we put editors on events and sports at the Olympics that they have expertise in. So as much as we're also using expertise photographers, we're using specialist editors as well to make sure that everything is running as smoothly and can be the best it can be. But also, for example, we will have athlete lists or we'll have big athletes that we need to tick off. At Getty Images, we will have a lot of big athletes in certain markets. So for example, in Australia, in America, in Europe. So that WhatsApp group is also a really good opportunity for the editors to just say to the photographers, could you keep an eye out on this athlete here? There's a story running about them today and we just need to make sure we can take a couple of pictures off for them. So it's a really good way of communicating stories and any live news that's just breaking. Um, mm. Because, you know, when we're editing, often we've got the commentary on and sometimes the commentary will give you something, a little piece of information or a little snippet that the photographers haven't got access to. So it's my job to relay that to the photographers just to make them aware. And not all the time it necessarily needs an action but it's just to keep them in the loop, keep them aware, so they are totally on top of what is happening in their venue and in their sport, basically. Yeah, I think there's also small things that come up. A big thing that comes to mind with swimming is the doping stories that have come to light recently with China and having Michael Phelps testify on Capitol Hill. There's a lot of conversation about doping. What is fair? What does that look like? And sometimes the images that we make on the ground aren't necessarily super stand out. You can imagine these editors are going through thousands of images a day. So saying, hey, just a heads up, I know this looks like two people just walking past each other, but this is a story because Mm. X, Y, Z. You know, this is a story because these two athletes have been outspoken about doping. And, And we've had situations where athletes won't stand next to somebody or bow their head or we'll do something subtle but it is a big storyline. So it's it's a great way to have that two-way street. Mm. Yeah, it's tapping yeah. into everyone's specialism, photographers and editors and, and sharing stories. I also really like the WhatsApp groups as well. For example, I did the uh, Winter Olympics in China. And at the end of the day, I used to drop in maybe five or six pictures from the session that we'd done, which were images that had just totally blown me away and that were fantastic and I'd loved seeing and loved editing on. It's always great to share that imagery because the Olympics, it's a long stint. It's an intense period of time. 
and actually just having those small moments to go, look, you did a fantastic job today. I actually love this picture. It's really nice to share that and builds a lot of kind of team camaraderie between photographers and editors. Mm. I imagine looking at thousands of images a day really does dull your senses. Um, and that, that seems like a good idea. So I think to jolt or go, this is, this is what we're looking for. These are the prizes. These are the kind of pictures that stand out from the rest. And it's good to share that kind of stuff because you can become desensitized after looking at a lot of images. Yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. It's always good to go back and review our work. So what we normally do is we put daily creations together for major events at so the Olympics. Um, so we'll have our um, editor-in-chief, Sean Botchell, and our director of editing globally, Lawrence Griffiths, and some other select people go through the servers and basically select the best of images. They're looking at the crops and the edits and just if something needs a little bit more of a tweak, they'll do that. We have a ranking system. So what I normally do is at the end of the day, is just kind of select our rank one, which is what we class as our, our best imagery and just flip through. And as you said, there are some images that really stand out. And I always look back with fond memories on the Winter Olympics in China. It was the first Winter Olympics I've done. I was never really into winter sport, to be honest, because in Europe, we don't really have much winter sport. So it's not very big over here. But actually, every day, there was pictures that were blowing me away. And the imagery was so amazing. That's the one of the best parts about the Olympics is you see sports and imagery that we don't get to see day to day. There's so many sports at the Olympics that don't get the coverage domestically and daily that do at the Olympics. And it's really fantastic to see. Mm. Mm. And now along that mm. same uh, uh, line of thought, what goes into training an editor to work at Getty Images? And, and what kind of characteristics do you look for when evaluating candidates for an editing position? The main one is passion for sport, knowledge for sport. Um, a little bit of a photography background, although what I will say is you don't have to have a photography background. I do have editors that have never picked up a camera or don't have a desire to be a photographer. Willingness to learn. I think with this industry, you know, it's a very exciting industry. It's a lot of fun, but it's just willingness to learn and getting on with the team. We have really strong relationships um, within our team and our ed edit teams. And I think as long as you've got like enthusiasm, you want to work, you love sport and have a passion for sport, then you can get trained and fit into the team. I think passion for sport is the main one because all of us at heart are just absolutely massive sports fans. Ah, okay. Passion. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. helps no matter what you're going into, I guess. <laughs> of course. <laughs> now, you guys are seeing cutting edge technologies. Is there anything that doesn't exist yet that you'd really like to see implemented in future generations of cameras or other gear that you're working with, things that would make your job easier. What, 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 what do you, when you think about what you want next, what is it? For me, I, there's not really anything I can think of off the top of my head. I think the advancement of cameras over the last two to four years with the mirrorless has been incredible. I think as we spoke about earlier, the ability to use robotic cameras now is opening up so many opportunities and so many doors that I think we've got some new technology that's incredible that people have been wishing for in, in previous times. Um, so from my side, there's nothing I can probably think about. But as someone that's probably using cameras day and day, I'm sure Maddie's got something um, that she'd like. Maddie wants the, uh, uh, the 10 to 700 millimeter F14 <laughs> lens. It's only three inches long and weighs four ounces. That's what she's waiting for, right? I mean, yeah, that would be incredible. I would love that. <laughs> I mean, I would say, though, what's great is certainly our gear is still heavy, but it's getting lighter with the mirrorless stuff, which is... It is getting uh, better. It is. Which is fantastic, particularly if you're doing something like golf where you're walking around for so long. No, I mean, I, I think that the cameras continue to come a long way. The biggest thing for me, especially being on these high pressure, fast paced events is just stability in communication settings within these cameras. Cabled is fantastic. And then this is kind of outside the cameras. It's making sure we have that connection, a solid data line or Wi-Fi network, something where if you could send out of camera consistently, quickly, 100% of the time wirelessly, that would be game changer. But it's getting there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, any other uh, uh, parting thoughts uh, from you guys? It's been an education today. Uh, we've come a long way with a lot of these things. Uh, that The technology is pretty amazing. And, and the intensity of your workflow uh, is, is impressive. You know, we pick up uh, a, a magazine or we go online and look at stuff and we just take it for granted that, you know, we expect to see this amazing stuff. But most people have no idea what goes on to get that little image to appear on that screen. Uh, so it, it, it's great to hear about what it is and makes us appreciate uh, it that much more. Of course, I would say that, you know, the Olympics are my favorite event to cover, and it's because of getting to work with such a great team. And I think that it's really easy to look at a byline, read a photographer's name, and not think much more. But I really care about how it says slash Getty Images and knowing how many people are behind us. And it would not be possible without the team that, like I told you, is already on the ground working on all of this. And LA Olympics is already in the works, things like that. So it is a huge effort and everybody is so important in getting these images out so everybody can see them. Wow. So aside from the uh, Paris games, Maddie, do you have any other projects coming up down the pike that uh, we might want to keep an eye open for? Sure. Copa America is going on right now. It is such a busy summer. So I'll be at the semifinals at MetLife Stadium and the final down in Miami, which is going to be really exciting. And of course, big on the horizon is the World Cup, which is a ways down the line. But locally in Boston, I mean... I can't complain. The teams here are pretty good. I'm excited for the Celtics <laughs> season and we will see how these Patriots do. Yeah, a lot going on in New England and a lot going on nationally after the Olympics. Yep, yep, yep. And, and if listeners want to catch up on what you're doing and follow your work, where should they go to? My Instagram is probably the best place. It's at Maddie Meyer 2, the number two, Maddie Meyer 2. That's where I, I mostly update my work. And that link will be in our show notes. So uh, definitely a follow-up. Uh, James, what about yourself? Uh, aside from all of these big summer games coming up, what do you have? Uh, uh, anything else on the pike? Uh, yeah, I'm currently working on the, the Euros uh, football soccer competition currently. So today is actually the, the third rest day of the tournament. So we're getting near the end of the tournament now of the quarterfinals coming up. Um, so that's been fantastic to work with the team on that. And that's been producing some fantastic pictures. Um, I'm looking forward to getting back to, to ringside in the boxing. So I, I still do do a little bit of photography and, and boxing is the sport that I photograph. Ah, okay. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back ringside after the summer of editing. Um, and then as Maddie said, just really looking forward to the next couple of years um, in America with the with the World Cup and, um, and the Olympics coming up. So it's really exciting time, basically. And if our listeners want to follow what you are doing, where can they go to? Same as Maddie, Instagram, uh, jameschance underscore five. Okay. And again, that link will be in our show notes. Uh, Maddie Meyer and James Chance, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, bringing us up to speed on what should be some pretty exciting games. I mean, technologic, I'm going to follow it just to see what you guys are actually doing and see what the end results are. Uh, it, it sounds fascinating. And I have a lot more appreciation for the kind of work that comes out of these events. Uh, again, it's more than just snapping a picture. There's an awful lot behind it. Uh, so again, thank you both for joining us today. Of course, thank you all. Yeah, thank you very much. Great speaking with you guys. Now, if you are a fan of the show, but not yet a subscriber, head on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, B&H's YouTube channel, or wherever you get your podcast and click subscribe. You can also find us on the Explorer blog, where we post photos from our guests along with our show notes. And please join us on Facebook at the B&H Photography Podcast Group, where you can share your favorite photos and comment about the show. I'm your host, Alan Weitz. Jill Waterman is our creative producer. Episodes are recorded, mixed, and edited by technical producer Mike Weinstein. And our executive producer is Richard Stevens. Welcome, sir. And on behalf of all of us, thank you oh so much for joining us today. Thanks to Samsung for sponsoring this week's episode.